really uh, you know can be developed and also you know what are the various aspects of a technology that need to be looked at but uh, you know as i go along uh, it is fairly generic also so that you have a overall flavor of mmis uh, so i'll just briefly touch upon uh, the wider material i think uh, dr gurdas the previous speaker has very nicely pointed out the requirement of uh, you know having a material which is other than silicon and uh, silicon is obviously going to dominate the computational part of the electronics industry but there are many other requirements where actually silicon does not do very well and rf radio frequency area is a one of the areas where actually it does not do well for various reasons and one of the primary reason is that the speed of the device is not large Uh, so it may sound little, uh, uh, you know, different that though we always talk about the speed, uh, but uh, silicon is not uh, a, has does not have such a high speed. If you particularly talk about analog applications, where actually silicon fails miserably, and you have to look at other materials. So traditionally, if you look at the RF electronics, uh, then actually gallium arsenide and indium phosphide usually prevails. Uh, gallium arsenide is little on the lower side. lower uh, frequency side but somewhat hard power uh, indium phosphide is actually is to very high speed but somewhat at the lower power now the gallium nitride comes along and this table actually highlights the various aspects of the gallium nitride which for which actually it has become so popular and gallium nitride is actually more popular for solid state lighting i think all of us are aware of gallium nitride led bulbs uh, but here actually i'm talking about the electronic part of it not the optical electronics part of it so gallium nitride has a large band gap and it has a large breakdown critical field so in essence because of this we can apply a very high voltage and as soon as i apply a very high voltage you can extract a lot of power from these devices made on gallium nitride and it can even operate at very high temperature also and that is actually uh, temperature is not something like you really heat up the device that that the device becomes heated just because you have applied a very large voltage and it operates with a very large current so i'll give you some typical numbers a typical gallium nitride rf transistor or rf mmis is operate at around 28 volt or 40 volt those are the standards and the current depends on the power you want to extract and the current can be as high as like 8 to 10 ampere of current i am not talking about milliampere it is 8 to 10 ampere of current so you can imagine that you are sending such a huge current over such a small area and you know, there will be power dissipation there will be increase in the temperature but you still want the transistor to work a semiconductor to still behave as a semiconductor and that is where the large band gap feature of the semiconductor really comes into picture now what are the other major feature for which gallium nitride is actually is very interesting and it has been taken up by the industry for rf applications is the saturation velocity so though we talk about the mobility a lot in in particularly in textbook you will see that we always talk about the mobility but unfortunately at dr manish said uh, we are very greedy and uh, because of our greediness we want higher speed and when we talk about higher speed then the low field mobility doesn't make much sense because we apply such a high voltage that the electrons already move at the highest velocity it can in the semiconductor and that high velocity is basically the saturation velocity so even if you increase the voltage further even if you increase the electric field further the velocity of the electron is not going to increase and that is the basically the saturation velocity so in terms of mobility you can see that gallium nitride does not have very high mobility compared to gallium arsenide uh, but actually the saturation velocity is much higher and therefore you have a very high uh you know of frequency operation for the gallium nitride and there are two popular figures of merit which are called johnson's figure of merit and baliger's figure of merit uh, they are actually they qualify that how good a material is for very high power devices and they actually uh, they both the gallium nitride i mean gallium nitride uh, you know uh, perform very well for both the figure of merit so in essence uh, gallium nitride has a very high potential and uh, the potential has already been validated and it has been taken up by the industry and it has already found many applications so now coming back to the title uh, this is gallium nitride based au band multi finger devices and mmis so let me just break it down a little bit uh, this is gallium nitride based device because we want high power 
and it is mostly high power density. So you can always think of it that you know, if you want high power, why don't we why don't we have a larger transistor? Yes, in principle you can have that, but we don't really want to have a like a, you know one foot by one foot uh, like a, a power amplifier. We don't want that. First of all, it is not feasible to have that for various RF considerations. But uh, we need also high power density, and that is where the gallium nitride comes into picture. KU band. It's a high frequency band, and this figure actually tells you uh, how the various bands play out and what are the various applications. So, though we are talking about the TU band, which is actually mostly for spectrum, satellite communication, but AC, AX, I mean, pretty much you can make up to car band devices have already been demonstrated on gallium nitride. And uh, even you can actually go to W band also. You need a little more engineering on the material side that I'll not talk about. But in principle, actually, you can go up to W band. And you can see the red ones are actually the military applications, and the you know the blue ones are for the civilian applications. And one of the very big civilian application that is going to come along is basically the 5G. And apart from that, as far as the strategic requirement is concerned, uh, we have the radars uh, as well as the satellite communication, where actually they are very frequently used, and actually uh, that is one of the need right now. Uh, to have these devices in these applications. Uh, high power, uh, so finally we need high power as I mentioned and some of the power amplifiers actually, uh, depending up, it depends on the band obviously at lower frequency. When I say it's lower, it is still actually like 5 to 10 giga or something like that. Uh, so at lower frequency you can have a, a power maybe of the order of like 25 to 100 watts and if you go uh, uh, in a higher frequency like 30 gigahertz and beyond, you can still have a requirement of about like 5 to 6 watts, something like that. But it obviously is application dependent. And therefore, you have to have high power. And uh, even with the power density of gallium nitride, you still need a very large device, large or weak device to have high power. And that is where the multi finger comes into picture. It is basically multiple transistors operating in parallel. That is basically the multi finger device. And this is an MMIC, uh, monolithic microwave integrated circuit, and that is the basically the uh, basic building block for any uh, RF uh, application. Because we want to have very efficient uh, uh, operations in the RF domain, and MMIC is the only way to. And that basically, you know, breaks down. So these four bullets basically breaks down the various aspects of this talk. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to put some thrust on each of this, but uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to cover all of them to the same depth. But if you have any question at any point of time, please you know interrupt me. I don't mind uh, not covering the entire topic, but uh, if it is interactive, that will be even more beneficial. Okay, so let's get started. So the heart of the MMIC is obviously the transistor, and uh, this is a high electron mobility transistor. So. Though it is, as I mentioned, you know, the name has become mixed over now. Uh, it is not exactly the high mobility that we look for, but still for historical reasons, we still call them high mobility transistors. But it is actually the high saturation velocity that matters in these transistors. Uh, high two-day concentration, I will explain this very soon. So basically, the, the electron density uh, in the channel region has to be high. Uh, if the electron density in the channel region is high, then you can have a larger current drive. And if one has a larger current drive, then the power is usually high, so it can handle higher power. So that is the motivation of having higher current drive. Uh, low contact resistance, so these are very high power devices, and I can never overemphasize the importance of having a low contact resistance. And apparently, as we go along, you see uh, the transistor action is actually very simple. Uh, in high electron mobility transistor, but it is a requirement that extreme condition at which these transistors operate uh, put a lot of uh, restrictions on how these devices can be fabricated. And it, it has to go through stringent qualifications so that it can actually operate at very high performance you know, without losing the efficiency. And no contact resistance is one of them. Uh, I'll talk about low source drain spacing. Uh, it may not be so apparent. Uh, but uh, as we go along, it will see that it has a we the performance uh, depends a lot. Not just the gate length. Gate length is obviously so called the holy grail. You know, we always want to reduce the gate length for higher speed. But uh, when you want to have a high power, actually, uh, 
you know, usually the reducing the gate length uh, has a detrimental effect. So we don't try to make the devices faster than what is required. And rather, at whatever is the required speed, at that speed, we try to increase the power level. Okay, and that is where the source drain spacing actually come in, plays a bigger role. Uh, appropriate position of the gate, uh, it's not just the gate where you place the, uh, it is not just the length of the gate, uh, that is important. It also, it is important how you place the gate with respect to source and drain. This is also a little unconventional. Uh, in uh, in MOSFETs, actually, you usually put the gate, uh, you know, exactly between source and drain. And uh, you don't have as such any preference for that. Uh, but you see, as we go along, uh, the gate is preferred to be placed close to the source rather than the drain for a high electron mobility transistor. And we have a, and then there is another aspect, which is surface activation. Uh, the reason I kept this bullet is that it sounds very trivial that, okay, I have to passivate the device, but uh, finally the device performance uh, to a large extent determ is determined by the surface passivation. How good is your surface passivation? And, uh, and the device performance a lot depends on these factors. So let's see how much I can cover. And as I mentioned that, Please interrupt me, you know, whenever you feel like. So why, what is a high electron mobility transistor? So if I look at the cross-section of a gallium nitrate based high electron mobility transistor, then this is how it looks like. Uh, we have an, if I go from the top, forget about the ohmic and the short key, uh, the algan barrier. So the algan barrier is, uh, is basically the high band gap material, even larger than the gallium nitride. So gallium nitrate is a smaller band gap material in this heterostructure. So this is the aluminum gallium nitrate is the large band gap material. Gallium nitrate is a small band gap material. And you have some layers beneath it. I'm not going too much into that, but these layers, the, the layers below gallium nitrate are required. I have kept a very simplified aluminum nitrate nucleation layer, but this is very important to have a very high quality material on which you can make the transistor. So quality of this gallium nitrate layer largely depends on how you are growing and particularly what are the layers you have beneath gallium nitrate. But that's a separate growth consideration that needs to be taken into account. Now coming back to the transistor, so what happens that this is a large band gap material, aluminum gallium nitrate, gallium nitrate is a small band gap material, and a channel is formed right at the interface of aluminum gallium nitrate and gallium nitrate. And this channel is called two-dimensional electron gas uh, it is two dimensional because by the very nature of this structure, this channel is a sheet charge, which is actually sitting right at the interface. If I go away from the interface into the gallium nitrate, the channel disappears automatically. And therefore it is called a two dimensional channel because vertically it's almost a sheet of charge and the two dimensional is basically the plane of the substrate. So that's why it is called two dimensional. And now in terms of transistor, so this is one ohmic, which let's call this a source. This is another ohmic, this is called drain, and this is called gate. Okay, so ohmics are obviously metals. I'll talk a lot more about it. Uh, then the short key contact, which is a gate, which is again a metal. And so you can see uh, the, the fundamental operation is pretty much similar to what a MOS does. Uh, we apply a bias between these two ohmic contacts, which is source and drain we apply a gate bias at the short key contact. And this algan barrier layer, I can very, you know, roughly say that this is basically the oxide. So if we apply a gate bias, then this channel at the algan gan interface is modulated by this short key gate. And that is how the transistor action comes into picture. And one important thing, I'm not going to dwell much on this, but you can have the entire structure undoped. That is a very great advantage of having a gallium nitride high electron mobility transistor. You don't need to dope it at all. Okay, the carriers come from surface states, but again, that is too detailed for the time being. I'm not going to dwell on that. But you can still have the carriers in the channel without have to doping the entire structure at all. So finally, coming back to the transistor operation, just like in any transistor, uh, two characteristics which are most important as far as the DC is concerned. One is the transfer characteristic. Transfer characteristic means drain to source current as a function of gate to source voltage. And then we have a output characteristic which is drain to source current versus drain to source voltage. 
and one important distinction of this high electron mobility transistor with respect to the conventional MOSFET that it's a depletion mode device. What does it mean? That the threshold voltage is negative. So this threshold voltage is negative. You can see that the if I apply a voltage, for example, for this transistor, which is a less than minus 4 volt, then the transistor is turned off. So this is a depletion mode device rather than an enhancement mode device, uh, which is like on silicon MOSFET. You can have an enhancement mode transistor on gallium nitride also, but that's again for different applications, and therefore I'm skipping it for the time being. So this is how overall a typical high electron mobility transistor looks like. But the timing I have kept the source drain and sorry uh, gate to drain and gate to sorry gate to source and gate to drain distance same. But as I mentioned, we can, we usually prefer to create an asymmetry for a different consideration that I'll talk about later. So now coming back to the performance, uh, performance you know one uh, general notion is that okay make the device smaller. Uh, make, keep on making it smaller. Yes, uh, making it smaller helps in speed. So if I talk about the unity current gain frequency, so basically this is the frequency at which the current gain is unity. And please note here we are talking about the current gain. We are not talking about the switching of this transistor because these transistors are meant for analog applications. So we are talking about the frequency at which you have some gain in the system. And the gain can be either voltage gain or current gain for the timing. One important consideration for transistor is the current gain. And the current gain has an expression which is basically GM by twice pi and divided by the capacitance, gate to source capacitance and gate to drain capacitance. So we'd like to make this transconductance higher. Okay, and transconductance, if you remember, it is nothing but the change in the drain to source current due to a change in the gate to source voltage. So we want the transconductance to be higher. And to have a higher transconductance, Obviously, we need a smaller gate length, so then the speed of operation will go up. But also, we need lower source resistance and lower source and drain resistance. So these two are important also. So we need to have a very small source resistance, drain resistance, and this is actually the output conductance. Uh, so we'd like to have uh, output conductance to be as small as possible. So the output impedance of the transistor should be very large, and uh, so that the output conductance is small and so that the transistor can operate at a very high speed. So these are the important considerations. And if I talk about a, a power, uh, when you talk about a power amplifier at RF frequency, we, this primarily depends on how much is the voltage and the current you can operate the transistor at. And we'd like to increase the, if it is a class A operation, again, uh, there are various ways you can operate a power amplifier, but if I take the very simple class A operation of a transistor, uh, then actually it is proportional to the current as well as the excess voltage you can apply uh, to the transistor. And therefore, there is an eternal need uh, for a power amplifier to operate at higher current as well as excess voltage so that we can extract the maximum power. So summarizing this, basically we need a smaller gate length if we want to increase the speed of the operation or increase the speed of uh, the transistor. And if we want to increase the power of the transistor, then we need to have a higher current and higher operating voltage. And these are the primary considerations that needs to be taken into account for uh, making the transistor operate for uh, these applications. So now, uh, before I jump into the fabrication, so let's talk about the consideration we need to talk about, take into account uh, while making these transistors. So one of the, uh, you know, this is a simple algan and heterostructure. This is the structure I talked about. Uh, and you can see actually, this is the large band gap material. This is the aluminum gallium nitrate. This is the small band gap material. And you see this blue curve. This is basically the sheet charge I'm talking about. And you can see actually the blue curve is plotted in the, uh, in the log scale. So uh, even a small change in the log scale is actually as a huge change in the linear scale, right? That is the very basic nature of the logarithmic plot. So what happens, you can see that, uh, you know, if I go into the transistor, even about say, uh, you know, four to five nanometers, there is a change in the density of electrons by almost like two to three orders of magnitude that can happen. So uh, what happens that the carriers are actually really confined very near the interface. Okay, and that is why I mentioned that this is called a two dimensional electron gas that carries the current in a high electron mobility transistor. 
now uh, this is one of the structure and you can do actually a lot of heterostructure design i'm not going into the detail but i let me just give you one more example now uh, this is aluminum gallium nitride gallium nitride and if i put just a thin layer of indian gallium nitride just below the gallium nitride then actually you see that the blue curve now i am able to cut down on the tail of the blue curve and what is the advantage in doing that it has actually uh, advantage of making a very short channel device and you still don't have the short channel effect so the reason i am brought, i brought this up that uh, the advantage of having a heterostructure uh, you know in comparison to a conventional mosfet is that you can do a lot of device engineering other in this case a lot of heterostructure engineering such that uh, you can have a higher performance you can do many things here i am showing you that how you can control the short channel effect by cutting down on the tail so that the channel is very well defined in the gallium nitride and since the channel is not spreading out into the bulk of the gallium nitride you are able to control the short channel effect and therefore these devices can operate at very very high speed without losing the gate control so this is one of the considerations you can actually make various other considerations also and depending upon the application you can come up with a new design now let's look at the major aspects of this transistors uh, for this rf transistor so this is again the same you know source drain and gate transistor and i just forgot to mention one thing there is another important distinction of this transistor compared to mos uh, though uh, in a mosfet we always talk about gate source and drain but we always have a substrate contact also so the mos is not exactly a or conventional mosfet is not exactly a three terminal device but it's a four terminal device source drain gate and substrate but in this case actually the substrate is floating and uh, it is actually a source drain gate it's essentially a three terminal device uh, fundamentally it's a three terminal device that we deal with in a high electric mobility transistor now what are the various considerations uh, source and drain as i mentioned that this is the contact resistance we need to have very low contact resistance we need to have a gate so gate length determine the speed of operation but as i also just mentioned we don't want to make gate smaller or gate length smaller than what is required because then you have a penalty on the power application how much power you can extract from these devices position of the gate with respect to source and drain is also important uh, we want to scale the distance between source and drain as well and also uh, what you are passivating it so this blue one is actually the passivation and passivation is basically the depositing some dielectric in the axis region of the between the gate and source and gate and drain so this axis region the blue lines is basically the passivation so these are some of the important considerations that you need to take into account while making the transistors on this device on this uh, substrate so let's talk about uh, you know a little bit detail on the ohmic contact uh, so uh, for the ohmic contact uh, the ohmic contact which is used for gallium nitride is actually tie aluminum nickel gold so, and the reason actually i'm going to discuss in little more detail so then you will understand why it is so important you know on each and every aspect of making a transistor so four metals tie aluminum titanium aluminum nickel and gold are put next to each other and then they are heated up which is called annealing basically you heat it up very fast uh, over a very short time short and that so it can be heated for almost like almost like 30 seconds or so that is the typical time we usually heat it up for and the temperature of heating can be between say 750 to 850 degrees celsius so you can imagine uh, you are basically bringing the temperature up very fast then heating it up and then again you know cooling the device what happens that uh, titanium uh, extracts nitrogen from aluminum gallium nitrate to form titanium nitride and that actually forms the ohmic contact so the ohmic contact is formed in a gallium nitride heterostructure by the formation of titanium nitride but then what are the roles played by this aluminum nickel or gold when titanium reacts with aluminum gallium nitride it actually extracts nitrogen so you can easily immediately imagine that once the nitrogen is extracted from titanium there will be a lot of voids okay and the quality of the aluminum gallium nitride is going to come down because of this voids so we don't want to create a lot of voids 
because then the quality of the alkene is going to come down but we still want some titanium nitrate formation otherwise we don't have the ohmic contact we have a very fantastic material but we don't have any context to it so in that case the metal is useless to us so that is where the aluminum comes into the picture when you heat it up actually aluminum reacts with titanium and therefore it controls the reactivity of titanium with alkene so that is the role played by the aluminum so the aluminum plays as an inhibitor in the formation of titanium nitride so you increase the temperature you try to form titanium nitride and aluminum is kind of giving you a control how much titanium nitride you want to form what is the role played by the nickel on the top of this contact you always want to have gold gold is a noble metal and you know that it is does not oxidize and finally you have to make contacts uh, to this uh, gold so that uh, you can make you know finally you have to connect this transistor to other parts of the circuit so and that is where the for the interconnect you need gold and for uh, rf it is always gold because gold has very low contact resistance and uh, you know it does not oxidize uh, at all and there are many other advantages in terms of skin depth or so on but those are other considerations but you prefer to have gold on top but when you are heating it up you don't want also aluminum to mix up with gold and that is where the nickel comes into picture actually nickel acts as a barrier here which does not which prevents uh, alloy formation between al aluminum and gold you cannot obviously prevent completely but you still have some barrier layer in between which actually prevents this formation of this alloy so you can see that each and every metal has some important consideration and that is how the ohmic contact is formed and uh, there have been about thousand more than probably thousand papers which have published in various aspects of this ohmic contact we have also like we started working on this ohmic contact about a decade back and we are still trying to make the contact better because it is that important for a rf devices so let's look at some of the data uh, you know what the uh, how the contacts look like so to extract various important aspects of this ohmic contact uh, uh, what is done is that we we make a geometry which is called plm is transmission line measurements or sometimes it is called transfer length measurement so what we do we make this contacts at specific distances like 5 micron 10 micron 20 micron and we measure the iv characteristic and plot the resistance of the function of separation and the slope of this iv characteristic gives us the sheet resistance and the intercept of this characteristic on the y axis gives the contact resistance so that is how we can extract the contact resistance for this on devices so what we did uh, we did actually uh, in you know the traditionally what is done you have always uh, put you always open the region where you want to make this contact source and drain and you then you deposit the metal uh, but there are several engineering possible and one of the engineering actually is what we did is actually the uh, plasma treatment so what we found out that if you treat that access so that ohmic contact by bclc chlorine and argon and then what happens that uh, you can actually have very low contact resistance so uh, so this is the bcl the chlorine argon treatment this is the typical method. and how does the uh, contact resistance looks like so you can see that uh, you can go from 0.65 ohm millimeter to 0.1 ohm millimeter if you do really this treatment and depending on the process variation it can be between the 0.1 to 0.2 ohm millimeter But typically you get a very low contact resistance if you do this plasma treatment and you may be wondering now to so see that uh, even without any treatment you already have a uh, contact resistance which is pretty low actually 0.65 or 0.5 contact per ohm millimeter is not a bad resistance uh, but as i mentioned these are very high power devices and that is where any resistance in any part of the circuit leads to losses and you want don't want the losses you want to minimize the losses and that is where actually it comes into the picture so you can immediately see that having a no contact resistance is so important for these devices and we did one of the ways uh, you know uh, to treat this uh, so that the contact resistance is very low and we did actually some analysis to find out that why this contact resistance is low we found out that and this is a plasma treatment basically get rid of oxygen uh, from the surface uh, before the metal is deposited and that basically leads to the uh, 
uh, better performance. And we we confirmed this by an extra photoelectron spectroscopy, and that is how it was confirmed. Uh, and also, when forming the contact, uh, you know, having a con low contact resistance is obviously the most important part. And but also one important aspect is that you cannot have the surface of the contact very rough, because uh, I'll show you later that finally you need to have a thick layer of gold on top of this contact. So after annealing, if your surface roughness is very high, then when you try to put any other metal on top of it, you are not going to have good contact. So we would like to have surface roughness minimized. Why still we want a high temperature operation? So you can see the requirements actually very conflicting, and in this case actually, uh, you can see that the, the the recipe which gave us the lowest contact resistance it has a surface roughness of 1.5 nanometer, and but you can still have actually better contact, better RMS roughness with HCl H2. So this is the traditional way of cleaning the region before depositing the ohmic contact. So you can see that it's a trade-off. We are sacrificing part of the roughness in lieu of lower contact resistance. So this is actually where the device engineering comes into the picture. Unfortunately, there is no universal method that okay, you do this and you get the best result out of it. You keep on tuning the processes for your technology based on your requirements. And this is one of the cases that if you really want a low surface RMS surface roughness, then you have to some other recipe. But if you really want to have uh, very low contact resistance as well as surface roughness, then you have to do something else. So this is one of the aspects. Uh, so we, we did, you know, we made the transistor out of it and so on. And we can see that the if I do this treatment, this plasma treatment, then we have a significant improvement in the performance. Uh, this transistor, particularly. Uh, I think channel length is not mentioned here, but probably it is about 250 nanometer or 300 nanometer channel length, where actually this transistor showed the unit kind gain frequency of about 65 gigahertz after this improvement. And we had actually improvement all around. So this plasma treatment actually really helped us uh, to improve the performance of these devices. So let's talk about another consideration for the ohmic contact, just to you know again emphasize you the importance of every aspect of this device. So the traditional ohmic contact, which is made on gallium nitride, is tie aluminum nickel gold. So first is titanium, then is aluminum, then nickel and the gold. So you can see that uh, typical thicknesses are also mentioned. And as I mentioned also, that after depositing the metal, you basically heat it up in nitrogen environment very rapidly. It is called RTP, or rapid thermal processing, by which you are able to form an alloy and you get a uh, low contact resistance. And we actually found out that there is another way to improve the uh, contact by inserting a layer of gold in between this tie aluminum. So let's look at that, and you'll then actually probably appreciate that why it is important to you know keep on investigating and you know come up with better ideas. So let's look at a typical tie aluminum nickel gold stack. So this is the tile and nickel gold stack. Uh, so let's look at this one. It's easy to follow. Uh, you know, this is the metal stack, and this is before annealing. Annealing, as I've been repeatedly telling you, annealing is basically nothing but short time heating. Okay. And as soon as you do the annealing, then you can see that it starts forming lots of threads, right? Lots of hairs are coming out because we are forming an alloy. So it is not going to be smooth. What you started with, it forms a lot of uh, you know, whiskers kind of thing, uh, and this is the source, this region is the drain, and the whiskers are protruding in the gate. And what's the problem? The problem is that when you try to lay down a gate between source and drain, you can see these whiskers can actually short the source and drain. Okay, so that's a big challenge. So if you want to prevent it, what you can do, you can keep the source and drain separated far away. Then actually it's fine. Okay, they will have squeezers, but okay, uh, you know you will not have the shorting of the source and drain. But the penalty will be paying that if your source and drains are far separated, then the resistance is high. And if the device resistance is high, then you have a penalty on the RF performance as well as the power performance. Therefore, one again and the conflicting need is that you have to keep the source drain close enough that. You don't have too much penalty on the power performance and the RF performance, but again, far enough 
that they don't short. So that has been always been the problem with traditional uh, omic contacts uh, on gallium nitride. And this age, uh, this age is something called the age acuity. Is basically how good is your age? You want is actually a perfect geometrical shape, but that is not the case when you do it on gallium nitride with the conventional stack. So what we did actually, uh, we actually did, by inserting a layer of gold. Uh, you can see this is uh, before annealing, this is as deposited, and this is after annealing. And you can see the whiskers are actually mostly gone. And that is again, uh, you can see that this is a little bit of device engineering or the material engineering, and it gives you a lot of benefit. Once the uh, whiskers are gone, then you can really put the gate in between source and drain without, without worrying too much about shorting the source and drain. So, therefore, you get an advantage. So then you can see uh, this metal stack actually helped you know in a great way, and I'm not going through the detail. We again did a lot of analysis, you know, and also we found out that what is the reason for this, uh, you know, forming less whiskers and so on. You can operate at a, uh, you know, uh, you have a larger process window. Uh, you can see that uh, even if you change the handling temperature, your contact is so frequency is not changing much. Uh, we have found out an optimum temperature at which you need to do the annealing so that you don't have the penalty on the contact resistance, but still uh, the the heat activity is good and so on. And with that, actually, we made the transistor. And the contact resistance for this metal stack, you can see, is over 0.5. So there is some improvement, 0.67 to 0.5. Uh, it is not a great improvement if you look at it apparently, but as I mentioned, for high power, this improvement is even great. And you don't have any change in the sheet resistance, so that tells us okay, uh, we are able to get the improvement without destroying other aspects of these devices. And finally, uh, we found out also the reason that uh, you know why it is forming uh, uh, you know better. Uh, you have actually a better age acuity and because of the larger grain size. We found out that's why the atomic force microscopy. Uh, we did some uh, you know XRD to understand. That what is really uh, what how it is really helping and why the contribution is still coming down. Uh, we did a TM analysis, transmission electron microscopic analysis, and we found out that we have a more formation of titanium nitride without uh, you know uh, as a, as a the, it is more uniform rather than having a larger depth, and that actually improved uh, the, the contact resistance. And so on. So we did actually a lot of physical characterizations trying to understand why is this happening. And as you know, one of the transistors, you can see that uh, you know this is the source and drain and gate. It is almost like picture perfect. Uh, you have a very clean uh, region between the gate and source and gate and drain. And uh, we could actually even place the source and drain with 300 nanometer separation. So you can see this is a 100 nanometer gate length, then 100 nanometer source, 100 nanometer drain. We took this exchange device just to show you uh, that you know we can put the gate uh, between source and end without any penalty. And these are the typical characteristics: IDVG and IDVD. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so the current drive is very very large. You can see you can have a current uh, you know more than one amp per millimeter. Uh, and also uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know we can have very high transconductance also and so on. So this characteristic look very good. Uh, we did the RF characterization also, and just by merely changing the source and drain separation, you can see that the current gain frequency, uh, the emitting current gain frequency has gone up from uh, 70 gigahertz to 93 gigahertz. So it's a huge improvement. Uh, you can see just by merely changing the device geometry, and we are able to change the device geometry by virtue of the fact that I don't have too many whisker formation, and that is because of the new recipe that we have developed. So you can see even just formation of the omic contact can, or just formation of the right omic contact can give you so much advantage in forming a, in having a better device. And then we, you know, looked at the other aspects to it also. I'm not going into the in those details. And finally, you know, all aspects of the transistor actually improved except for the uh, breakdown voltage, if you bring the source drain too close, then obviously what happens that uh, your operating voltage will come down because you have a larger electric field to deal with. 
uh, but uh, you, the device operates at higher efficiency, so you can expect actually almost the same power without worrying about the efficiency of the uh, without uh, worrying about the too much losses. So you can have the advantage as well in the power. So uh, let's look at the other part, uh, the gate position variation. So what I have been talking about that this is the source, this is the drain, uh, this is the gate in which sitting in between. Uh, in this case, we kept the uh, source to drain distance little large. As I mentioned that we made the earlier device source distance very close to prove a point that the recipe really works and you have an edge equity which is very large. Uh, but uh, you don't want to have very uh, small source drain separation or high voltage devices because the device will tend to break down fast uh, if they are very close by. So this is one of the aspects. Uh, how does the performance change? Uh, you know, if you still maintain the same gate length, but but vary the position of the gate between source and gate. So this is another device engineering uh, we looked at, and this is some of the results. So uh, you can say this is LGS. LGS is nothing but distance between the gate and source. So everything else is remaining same. <coughs> we are just moving the gate away from the source. So increasing LGS means I'm moving the gate away from the source. Or decreasing LGS means I'm moving the gate closer to the source. So you can see that as I'm moving gate closer to the source, as I go down, the transconductance is going up. So you can see this is the LGS of 0.25 micron, and this is LGS of about 3.8 micron. So, and I have a performance improvement. The current goes from 0.6 ampere per mm to close to being 1 ampere per mm. And accordingly, your transconductance also improves from 150 to about uh, close to being 250. And transconductive improvement means in your high speed operation that I mentioned earlier, the transconductance, you want to have higher transconductance because that will finally decide how fast the devices can operate. And we actually could achieve this without any penalty on the substitutional part. The substitutional part is basically the characteristic which is going to be determined that how much leakage you have and how much is the power dissipation and also the gate control. So if you want to, you want to have very high uh, substitutional uh, characteristics so that gate has very good control. And also uh, you can see I on by I off ratio is very, very large. So it is close to being 10 to the over 8. So that basically tells us that we are able to improve the performance of this transistor without actually, you know, sacrificing other part the characteristics. And this is the drain to source current characteristic, and that also shows, you know, very significant improvement in the current drive. Uh, we did actually a lot of analysis. I'm not going into the detail, uh, but uh, one very important uh, understanding uh, from this device engineering is that if you place the gate very close to the source, actually your breakdown voltage goes up. Actually, that shows here. So, uh, or rather, let's look at it this one. Uh, this is, you can see that as I'm increasing LGS, so this is LGS 3.8 micron, LGS 2.8 micron, so on. So, as I'm decreasing LGS, the LGD is going up. The gate to drain distance is increasing, gate to source distance is decreasing, and this is done with a fixed source to drain separation of 5 micron. So you can see the breakdown voltage has gone up to more than 175 volt just by merely position, positioning the gate properly. So you can see that, you know, in, in the previous case, we just changed the metal stack to have a, a better contact. Now, and that is the material engineering part of it. And now this is the device engineering part of it. So we are able to make the device a lot better by just properly designing the device. And these are actually very important aspects of any technology that if you want to have very good devices, then obviously you have to look at the material aspect and you know, process conditions, but you should not lose the oversight that finally uh, you this device is meant for a particular application and you have to design the device appropriately. And you have to consider, find out the niche effect that is pertaining for those technology. In this case, it is gallium nitride. And also we found out there were you know, various reasons that why this is uh, happening and so on. Uh, we found out that we can get a power output of 5.1 watt per millimeter at just VDS 10 volts only, sorry, VDS 20 volts. If you increase the power, increase the voltage, you can increase the further power further. 
and there is several other mechanics to, to increase the power i am not going into the details something called field plate and so on you can increase the operating voltage as well as operating uh, in the power delivered by these devices so this is some of the considerations in ohmic so i talked about two considerations one is ohmic contact resistance and you know placing the gate appropriately between source and drain there are hundreds of other considerations that you need to consider in that needs to be taken into account to have you know good devices let's talk a little bit about passivation uh, again you know passivation is something uh, which is not uh, so much talked about in any technology but uh, that is not the case for gallium nitride in gallium nitride passivation plays an important role and what is the meaning of passivation actually passivation is just look at this structure <clears throat> it's again the same structure source and drain and uh, this is the gate and you can see that i put a silicon nitride around it so uh, so between the gate and drain uh, between the gate and drain and between the gate and source also we some not sometimes that you prefer to have a silicon nitride and it has certain properties that actually uh, important and that's why the passivation passivating for these devices is very very important So let's look at that. Suppose I have a device without passivation. So that means I have not put the silicon nitride. And uh, if I look at the IDVD characteristics, you can see that we have plotted VDS characteristics up to 30 volts. And it goes up. The current goes up. It shows very nice characteristics, just like a you know regular transistor. But as you keep on increasing VDS, that you can see that higher VDS, the current is coming down. And this is actually a phenomenon called current collapse. uh it happens because of you know subtle reasons like heating and then trapping and so on uh, virtual gate formation and so on but those are little irrelevant now but what happens the current basically comes down at higher voltage and that is not good because if the current comes around the higher voltage then i am going to have a penalty on the output power i will not have the efficiency i am looking for for this transistor but if you passivate the device then you can see that the power drop is actually insignificant so you can see the power drop has come down our uh, current has not current is more steady even up to 30 volts for this devices and it, and the you know the the, uh, the the drain to source current is about 1 amp something like that and just look at the power actually the transistor is right now at bias at this 30 volt and 1 amp per mm 1 1 milliampere or 1 mm or 1 amp per mm So if it is an uh, you know one mm device, basically we are pumping a power of 30 watt, and that's a lot. So you can imagine that just a transistor handling a 30 watt. And to give you some example, uh, your laptop charger actually operates at about maybe like 40 to 60 watt. So you can imagine that you know the amount of power these uh, devices can handle, and the amount of miniaturization you can have uh, without losing the efficiency. So anyway, coming back to the passivation, uh, so you can see the passivation is very important, and uh, in this case, actually, the passivation, passive device also should should better performance in terms of uh, you know FT or Cartesian gain frequency. What I've been talking about, this is 36 gigahertz, and these numbers changes uh, with the gate length. So we always compare that uh, with a control device which is identically fabricated, except the passivation is not there. So that's why it is 30 gigahertz with this 36 gigahertz and so on. And uh, the performance is improved. So I'll just briefly mention the reason I have not talked about in detail. So what happens that if you put silicon nitride in the access region, it creates a tensile strain, and because of which the two-day density, the two-dimensional electron gas density in the access region improves, and you have a lower resistance coming from the access region. So finally, actually, it boils down to that you have your uh, your current improves. and also uh, some of the trapping which goes on in the access region is actually prevented by the silicon nitride passivation and therefore you have don't have too much of a virtual gate formation or trapping and that actually improves your uh, ft of the transistor and your frequency dispersion comes on and so on so it basically behaves more uniformly even if you go high up in frequency and that's the advantage you get and you got to passivate the devices otherwise they are not useful for practical applications now coming to multi finger actually i am running short of time so let me just uh, you know i'll quickly go through uh, uh, the other aspects of why multi finger so 
you know, uh, suppose you have a one transistor with one finger. So suppose this is a gate. So consider this. Uh, uh, this is a single finger gate line, and if I want to have larger current, I basically which increase the width of the device. Right. So suppose I want to have a very large current. Can I increase the length of the gate, the width of the gate, maybe like you know five millimeter? Can I keep on increasing the you know uh, width of the gate? The answer is no. Why? Because these are RF transistors. So if I look at the wavelength correspond to various bands. So for example, starting from C band, which has a wavelength of free space wavelength of 3.75 centimeter uh, to 7.5 centimeter. If I go to car band. Which is 0.75 to 1.13 centimeter. So what is the problem? The problem is that if your length of this, if we call it finger, if we, if the length of the width of the gate is too long, then the problem is that it will start giving as an antenna. So remember that we used to have this antenna on our you know rooftops, and uh, the basic principle of having an antenna is that uh, length of the antenna. Should be of the order of wavelength, so we, we call it dipole, lambda by four dipole, lambda by two dipole, and so on. So basically, it is a significant fraction of the wavelength of the signal it is handling, and then instead of transmitting the energy, it will start radiating the energy. So the problem is that as you go high up in frequency, you can cannot keep on increasing the width, sorry, the width of the devices, and because Instead of carrying the energy from one end of the gate to the other end of the gate, the gate will still be start giving in the antenna and start radiating energy. And how to solve this problem? If you want to have a larger width device, then you try to have multiple smaller width devices so that you start still do not radiate the energy and the gate loss is minimum. Okay, and that is how the consideration of a multi-finger device comes into picture. In addition to the fact that I want to have a larger power, so I want to increase the effective width of the device, but I don't want to radiate the energy. I want to amplify and do all other processing without radiation, and therefore multi-finger is one of the choices that we need to look at. So, how a multi-finger device looks like? So, multi-finger device looks like actually a little tricky uh, because uh, I have to have source drain and a gate in between, but all these gates has to be connected together also. So, this is a as it is a little complicated, but let me try to explain it. We have a common drain pad, we have a common source pad, so this is the source pad, and the gates, so these are the gates. So all the gates are shorted, all the drains are shorted, but the problem is it's a planar structure. So I cannot, in the same plane, I cannot short all the source also, but I want to sh short all the source because finally all these multiple fingers have to be over the single transistor. So how to short them? I have to put an air bridge. So that is one of the ways to deal with it. We connect such you know neighboring sources by air bridge. What is the meaning of an air bridge? So the air bridge looks something like this. So you can see this is an air bridge, and and probably you can also appreciate the beauty of this uh, you know nano structure. Uh, your gate and one of the drain is going to run below the bridge. So it is like a river flowing, and you have built a bridge. You know, from one island to the other island, and these islands are actually source, nothing more, nothing else. And you have certain, you know, dimension that you have certain need certain height for the bridge because the gate is going to run below this bridge as well as you are going to have a source drain and so on. As well, you need certain length of the bridge also so that you know they can. I I want to have multiple devices. You can think of it as more of a stitching kind of thing. I'm stitching all the sources together. And therefore, it has to have certain robustness also. Okay, and the, so therefore, it has to be developed appropriately. And this is usually is a little, I know it's a complicated process, but it's a little tedious process. This is done by a, a bilayer photoregist uh, with electroplating technique. And if you're interested, we can you know discuss about it in question and answer, uh, by which actually you can generate these uh, air bridges. For making these transistors, so this is actually one typical device. For example, uh, this is actually a 16-finger device. We just wanted to see how far we can stretch ourselves. Uh, as we keep on increasing the number of fingers, uh, one of the practical challenges that come into picture is the yield of the device comes down. That uh, it's such a it's for technology. You, you cannot like make thousand transistors and just like you know ten of them works. 
uh, rather you have to have a higher yield to make it commercially viable and also you have to have higher uniform performance. So that puts on you know, certain limitations on how many fingers you have and so on. Uh, but uh, in principle, uh, we even uh, made many transistors with 16 fingers and it was still robust and we could see the proper characteristics also. Uh, this is like drain to source current which is found to show good characteristics. Uh, this is a 16 finger device. We are actually still measuring because the current level is so high. Uh, we need to find out a way to measure the uh, current in these transistors without, you know, damaging our instrument by which we are measuring. And uh, therefore, we need to have certain considerations for that. But the, the secondary thing, but yes, we can make very high current devices actually having a multi finger structure. And but having a multiple in the structure, you have certain penalty also. Um, unless you are careful, you can see that the uh, current gain frequency actually comes down for this transistor. You can deal with it actually in other device engineering way, uh, but uh, I'm not going into that. But you have to be careful also when you try to span out your device in multiple in the structure. Uh, the RF performance will be coming down if you don't do anything. The, the simple reason is that you have a lot more parasitics. Uh, particularly parasitic capacitances and that leads to a lot of problems. And now uh, finally, uh, uh, the MMIC part, uh, the MMIC part, so I talked about the transistors, so this is the transistor and I talked about only certain aspects like gate, uh, sorry, uh, source drain, access region, uh, passivation, but there are many considerations to that also. For example, how, when you do this passivation, what kind of treatment do you do in the access region before passivating it? Uh, that is also important. Uh, uh, for example, you know, when you're making these transistors and you have to have many transistors of, uh, you know, functioning uh, together to make a, a circuit out of it, then you need to a common ground. So to have a common ground, it is little non-trivial that uh, the common ground is provided from the bottom of the substrate actually. So what is done, you thin down the silicon carbide substrate, put some layer from the bottom and all the sources are connected to this bottom plate which acts as a ground plane. And there is, you know, for an RF amplifier or any RF circuit, you need a reference plane and which is actually provided by the bottom of the substrate. So you need to do a lot of back-end processing also. Uh, there is certain aspects like it generates a lot of heat so this has to be properly put on a heat sink uh, so that you know the device don't get heated up so fast. So you have to have certain you know packaging consideration also, and so on. So there are actually as far as the technology is concerned, uh, these are actually all small bits and pieces, but probably hundreds of them have to work together to make a uh, technology or to make something work. So this is the transistor. What I did not talk about the other passes, for example. You know that if you want to make a circuit, then uh, having a transistor is not good enough, right? You need to have resistor, inductor, and capacitor. And unfortunately for RF, uh, they are actually equally challenging. Uh, it's not that I can just make a resistor and hoping that that will work. And the resistor means you cannot have bulk resistor anyway uh, for these high applications. So we need some sort of important resistor. We make titanium based. Actually, we prefer tantalum nitride or nichrome resistors because of certain temperature coefficient and so on. Um, we make inductors. Inductor design is also very challenging because the quality factor of the inductor, uh, you know, is important. Uh, you need to have very high quality factor so that the resistance is low, uh, but inductance is high. This is again actually conflicting requirement. If you want to have higher inductance, then you need to have larger spiral. Uh, but as soon as you increase the with the the, the area then the resistance goes up and you have a penalty on the uh, quality of the inductance and you also make it spiral for certain uh, consideration that uh, you know you don't uh, basically your uh, you know, flux should be you know, unidirectional and so on that's why actually you try to make a, a spiral inductor then the capacitor is also important your capacitance has to operate at very high frequency and so on so you have to make capacitor so what is usually done uh, for the MMIC design, uh, you have this transistors, you have a library of this transistors, as I talked about two fingers, four fingers, you know, ten fingers and so on. Usually you don't go beyond ten fingers. You can have multiple widths uh, and usually you don't go beyond 250 to 300 micron. You have a model for this transistors. You have a library of inductors. 
you cannot just have any inductor you want in principle if you want to have good inductor usually you have a library of inductors and you know the all the characteristics of the inductor you have a you know library of capacitors you have a library of resistors then you have model for all of them and then you design a circuit so this is an ads simulation which is a standard tool it is called advanced design uh, design simulation which is a proprietary item from tsi and uh, there actually you can uh, import this library and this is called the process development kit of pdk by which actually you can uh, design a circuit and finally make a circuit out of it and finally test the characteristics so i talked about the transistor but the passes are equally important and actually uh, trust me these are passes are you know some of the passes are very tough to make particularly the quality we look for and the considering the high frequency and sometimes the transistor is easier than the passes actually in on some occasions and so if we really put together uh, make a design do the simulation if it works make a circuit mmic this in this is the power amplifier uh, if it doesn't work you go back try to find out what is the problem you change your design go through couple of iterations and then actually you can get to see the mmic yeah thank you uh, that is all uh, uh, in a nutshell you know how an mmic uh, looks like and what is this you know various aspects of the mmic So thank you. I have to take some question here. Yeah, if there is time. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, you can see questions in Q and A uh, tab. Okay. okay. Let me. It is on the right hand side actually. Okay. Let me. Sorry. Uh... I think uh, if you go out of the presentation mode, then uh, it will okay. be coming down here. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. In that right side. Just stop sharing. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, it's question and answer. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. So there are few of them. Let me just go through them. Okay, nucleation layer. Uh, so Anurag is asking that uh, explain more about the significance and cons of nucleation layer. So actually, what happens? Uh, this is a heterostructure. So you uh, for high performance uh, RF transistors, we prefer silicon carbide because gallium nitride does not have a native substrate. For example, in silicon, your substrate is also silicon, but in gallium nitride. Uh, you can have gallium nitride as a substrate, but right now it is still in the nascent stage, and you cannot have a large area substrate. So what happens? The closest match of gallium nitride as a good for a good substrate is silicon carbide, but there is still a lattice mismatch between gallium nitride and silicon carbide. So when you try to grow gallium nitride on silicon carbide directly, what is going to happen? That you are going to have a lot of defects you cannot just grow one material on top of the other material because there are different types like you know i cannot go around and be a friend with everyone because all of us are different but usually for example i and professor arun go along very nicely because actually we have some matching so something like that so we, we actually the the material has to be you know when we put them together actually they have to have certain properties so silicon carbide is the closest match but still there is some mismatch so we need an intermediate layer and that is actually nucleation layer so before uh, start growing the gallium nitride which will contain the channel we put some material and nucleation layer is like you know one of those material one of those layers which basically helps us to grow uh, high quality gallium nitride so the gallium nitride is defect free and uh, i'll not say defect free but it contains less number of defects and it you know it has certain uh, uh, i mean technically it actually filters the dislocations you have less number of dislocations on the surface and so on so technically uh, it's you know you can actually characterize also how good uh, what is the quality of gallium nitride or what kind of material you can do on gallium nitride using a uh, any aluminum nitride nucleation layer so this is basically the purpose of having a nucleation layer to have high quality uh, material on which you can make this devices 
Okay, so uh, then uh, it should be great. Explain more nutrition here. Yes. Uh, how? Okay, uh, could you please explain? Uh, this is from Sri Lakshmi. Uh, could you explain how the negative polarization charges at the gal galgan surface is affecting the short key contact and related field? Uh, so uh, it is just pure electrostatics, uh, right? If you have a uh, negative charge, uh, negative polarization. So basically, let me. I, I skip that part. Uh, so to have electrons uh, in the channel, you have surface states which are actually are the donor charge. So what happens? The surface states give you the electrons. These electrons come to the two direct channel, and the surface states in become charged. And because it is charged, now you can immediately imagine that it is going to play some role in the electrostatics. But below the gate, actually, it does not have much impact. Because on the top of the aluminium gallium nitride, you are going to put uh, metal, and metal is basically is a perfect source for electrons. So all this deficient you are going to create because of this depletion of the surface state, it is going to be replenished by the metal, which is a source of electrons. But you are going to have a lot more problem in the axis region, and that is why I mentioned that passivation uh, in the axis region is very very important for gallium nitride. Because of this, primarily these charges, and they play a major role in terms of you know how much trapping you have. You can have trapping. You can create actually spikes in the electric field because of this. The device can break down early and so on. So there is because those are some of the problems that are actually addressed by the passivation. Otherwise, you are right. Uh, they have huge impact from the electrostatics perspective, and particularly they act as a trapping layer. Okay, another question is. Uh, Uh, from Navneet, uh, gallium nitride uh, just below algan acting as a channel here. Mole fraction algan affects its properties. We need to fix the mole fraction. Yeah. So the mole fraction of aluminium gallium nitride I mentioned 30 percent. Uh, so what happens that if you have a larger content of aluminium, then the two deck density goes up. So you prefer to have actually larger content of aluminium. And in the extreme case, we would like to have aluminium nitride on top of gallium nitride. that will be the best thing to have actually but the problem is as we go away from gallium nitride and go towards more in the aluminium nitride there is a larger lattice mismatch and it's for the same consideration i talked about the growth so what will happen the, there will be a lot of defects at the aluminium nitride gallium nitride interface that is going to deteriorate the performance of the transistor so you cannot have arbitrary mole fraction that you would like to have aluminium gallium nitride so therefore it is found out that from considering that usually 30% aluminium content is a good compromise but if you want to have a larger aluminium content then you need to reduce the thickness of the aluminium gallium nitride layer and what is the consequence of that if you have a thinner aluminium algan barrier then your gate leakage current will be more and therefore the performance will be coming down because of these various considerations you have to decide on the mole fraction as well as the thickness of the barrier but as you have asked for with the 70% mole fraction yes you can make the transistor with 70% mole fraction with a thinner algan barrier and larger gate leakage current is yes, it is possible for certain application it may be useful to have a larger mole fraction okay uh, which epitaxial layer um, these are the base for terahertz application uh, so terahertz actually is not exactly my forte Uh, so i would not comment much on that uh, but terahertz gallium nitride is actually good for terahertz detector uh, but as i mentioned that i am not really an expert in the terahertz so i you know i prefer not to comment on this maybe some other speaker you know will be able to clarify your doubt more uh, on in no which of the following curves help us to calculate the iron by i of ratio of ganem and what is the typical value of iron by of ratio of conventional ganem so uh, the gallium nitride as i mentioned is a enhancement mode transistor and so i on is considered as whatever is the drain to source saturation current at vgs zero so get to source voltage zero is a depletion mode transistor so even if your get to source voltage is zero you still have an i on i of is actually taken just below the Special voltage. So usually, suppose your special voltage is minus three volt, then you take the I of at minus five volt or so, and then you take the ratio of these two current to find out I on by I of. 
uh, typical values uh, i'll say you know of the order of 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 and a very high quality uh, transistor will have a tra uh, ion by ion of about 10 to the over 10 but you need to have a oxide dielectric for that then you can have very high ion by ion uh let me know whenever you want me to stop okay so yeah. i guess the uh, questions are over then um, uh, we can stop no actually there are few more do you want me to go through them or uh... yeah if 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 you are having uh, time yeah right right i'll be very happy to do that actually i like this part more than rather than a conversation yeah please go yeah. ahead thank you so, yeah what is the maximum ft and f max possible theoretically and practically yes okay uh, Maximum value uh, I, for FT, it has been reported up to 300 gigahertz. Uh, about, uh, if I remember it correctly, it is about 20 to 30 nanometer gate length, uh, where FT is uh, 300 gigahertz and F max is about 600 gigahertz. So F max is usually larger than the FT, and that is a good thing for us uh, because F max is actually unity power gain frequency, and you want to have power gain in the system. So uh, people have reported up to 600 gigahertz for F max and 300 gigahertz for FT for extreme scaling and you need to do a lot of device engineering it's not that you just put a small gate length and you'll get that performance but yes the numbers are very large then RN uh, Vishwanath uh, is the scaling effect on physics property influence the miniaturized devices is the scaling effect on physics property uh, I hope you are talking about that whether the physical property of the material Scaling effect on physical property. I'm not able to follow it completely, but let me try to understand. Is the scaling effect? Scaling effect of physical property in nature. So yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, right. So now I understand what is basically effect of scaling. So uh, the scaling uh, obviously increases your FT. Okay, so uh, if you reduce the channel length, you are going to operate at very high frequency. What is the penalty? The penalty is that your power is going to come down because you are gate length is smaller it is going to break down faster and not only that uh, your gate is going to lose control right if your source and drain is coming very close or gate is very close to the source and drain and gate length is very small then all those effects what you see in MOSFET for example one of the typical phenomena is drain induced barrier lowering right where the channel carriers are controlled by the drain voltage rather than the gate voltage ideally you always want to control the channel by the gate not the drain but if you do the scaling then uh, one of the major detrimental effects at that is that the gate is uh, the channel is controlled by the drain rather than by the gate and therefore you have a performance deterioration so that is one of the major aspect or major detrimental effect you are going to see because of the scaling but obviously you are going to get higher speed because of the scaling so that is the advantage uh, Suresh uh, is it possible to use field plate technology instead of multi fingers? Uh, yes, uh, but please try to understand uh, multi finger and field plate. In some case, they uh, give us the same option, uh, increasing the power, uh, but field plate actually improves the operating voltage of the device. So, yes, uh, and you can actually, suppose you want to operate the transistor at 40 volts, uh, you've got to have a field plate actually. You, you can't do much about it. Uh, but if you still op you can operate at 28 volt and high power, uh, then you can live without the field plate. So uh, partially you are right. If I just want certain amount of power without wor worrying about the drain to source voltage, then you are right. I can operate at multi finger or I can operate at a smaller number of fingers, but increase the drain to source voltage. But once the drain to source voltage is fixed, then there is no other choice but to increase the number of fingers to increase the power of the device. AFP technology is also a metallization process. Mm, yes, right. Uh, Filtrate is nothing but you have it's a secondary gate actually. Uh, you know, it's simple. I think it is uh, overemphasized from the technological perspective, but it is an extension of a gate which has a capacitance of coupling to the channel, which is little less than the ch actual channel region. Otherwise, you are right. It's basically, it's a metallization process. Nothing more than that. Uh, could you please, uh, from Sri Lakshmi again, uh, share, could you please share the important points to be considered for validating the simulation of GAN-HEM? Yes, uh, in Silva-Colite TCAT tools, 
with experimental data. So, Sri Lakshmi, actually, glad that you asked this question. This is a very important consideration. So, those who do TCAD, we do also TCAD a lot. Uh, you cannot just blindly simulate the device and hoping that what you are, whatever the simulator is performing or whatever simulator is predicting, you are going to get the same performance. So, you have to calibrate the model. So, what are the important calibrations that need to be considering in, uh, that need to be taken into account for the devices are you have to match the characteristics. So, the two characteristics you need to match IDVG and IDVD. So IDVG transfer characteristics for various VDS, then IDVD output characteristics for different VG. So, that actually these are the characteristics you need to match for DC. Then you need to match for the RF. So, in RF matching, you try to match the S parameters, okay, scattering parameters, scattering matrix parameters for these devices that basically match the RF for these devices. So, with that, once you have the matching both for DC and RF, then you can be pretty much sure that whatever the device, whatever the simulated data, whatever the simulations your TCAD is showing, you are going to get the similar performance on the device. I'll just give you one out of caution is that even if you do that, uh, you cannot still operate the device at very high power because high power gives rise to nonlinear modeling and that is little difficult to do. But still, if you just do match the IDVG and IDVD and S parameter for the single, uh, for the low, uh, you know, small signal model, that will still give you a very good uh, estimate what kind of performance you are going to get from this device. So, those considerations need to be taken into account. Then, Shivansh, uh, sir, which epitaxials? Uh, say among these are the best for terrorized application. I actually for terrorized aluminum nitride, usually if you go towards nitride more, then actually you get a more terrorized application. Uh, but as I mentioned, I'm not an expert. So now, uh, Dr. Ragini, um, can MSC physics candidate apply for projects in nano electronics? Uh, actually, we prefer that. Uh, because you can see it's mostly material and physics that we talk about. It has a lot of engineering also, but we have a huge population of, uh, you know, uh, from the physics, material science, as well as from chemistry, because all the boundaries, I think Dr. Manish was mentioned, all the boundaries are gradually disappearing. So, uh, we want actually, it's a multidisciplinary activity and we want people from everywhere and physics is most welcome. Uh, Okay, I guess uh, that is all, that those are the only questions of the room. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for addressing all the questions and uh, covering basic steps for the designing of uh, hand devices. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think we are having uh, Dr. Rawal Saab also from SSPL. Yeah, hello, Dr. Rawal, how are you? Hello, ha. good afternoon, good afternoon, Professor. Yeah, Hi. good afternoon, good to hear your voice. Uh, given in detail all the basic concepts, so you have made my talk very easy. So I will go directly to the technology. <laughs> okay, that will be great, yeah. I'll also try to join, uh, I've seen your talk, I'll try to join that also. It's okay. nice to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Karun. I think that is all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sa, for accepting our request to deliver your talk and uh, sharing your knowledge with the participants. Thank you very much. Yeah, it has always been pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So, there is an announcement for the participants that uh, next session, which is on Spintronics by Professor Brajesh Kaushik, is, uh, is, will be starting a little bit late at 1 o'clock. Actually, Dr. Brijesh got uh, some urgent uh, uh, assignment right now at their institute. So, uh, he has uh, suggested that we will start at 1 o'clock. So, uh, we will meet again uh, quarter to 1. So, thank you very much, Dr. Huda. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dipanka, sir. I think he left. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rahul, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Rahul, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, Huda ji. How are you? Good afternoon, sir. Fine. How are you, sir? Oh, fine. It was nice listening to you. It was a very good, interesting talk. You started with all the details of the complications of technology.